First of all, Renee, congrats on the two years. All right, Renee, you already know what I'm going to ask. So, like your biggest fan here, Justine. A happy two year anniversary. Happy two year anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy two years. I think you know what this is going to be. Two years ago, I quit my big media job and started this channel. And then 2020 happened and I panicked. But all of you were just so here for it beyond any expectation. And I just, I wanted to celebrate a little bit and say thank you with this AMA YouTube style. Let's do it. I kind of just want to know from you what has surprised you the most in the last two years, whether it comes from the video making process or the behind the scenes or something you didn't expect. What, what has surprised you of all people the most in the last two years? How much I love making videos. I love everything about it from the process, just learning how to color grade and do sound design and now a little bit of animation. And then the storytelling itself, which isn't just writing or isn't just podcasting or isn't just video, but it's a culmination of everything from the outline to what you say when you record it to what you put together when you edit it. Each layer is an opportunity to tell that story better and maybe reach more people. It's just the most fantastic thing I've ever done. And I wake up every morning, as corny as it sounds, in like utter disbelief that I get to do this. If I summon the power to make each one of your fingers release any liquid for your own personal intake, so you want water, Coca-Cola, beer, what have you. What are each of these five faucets gonna supply you with? Answer now or forever hold your peace. Espresso, latte, cappuccino, Americano, and water. And if I had to get more specific than that, maybe it would be like Phil's mint mojito and then bitter and sweets, a red velvet latte. And I, either way, there's gonna be just a hell of a lot of coffee from these digits. Do you ever have existential crises? Crisis, crises. Yeah, like from the very Vulcan, nothing unreal exists, just to, you know, I have nothing left to say, nothing left to record. How am I ever gonna make a video again? A lot of times I can just be procedural about it, like just literally put one video making foot in front of the other, but sometimes it's the equivalent of staring at that white sheet of paper and I've just got to do something else, anything else. At some moments, it's all the existential, just all of it. If you had to put everything you own, like all the cash that you possibly have access to and you put it either into Bitcoin or Ethereum or Apple stock and you weren't allowed to touch it for 10 years, what would you put it into? Oh man, 10 years is a total trap because it's very easy to think short term and then it's very easy to think long arc of history. But when you put something between the five and the 10 year mark, then suddenly it's the sum of all your fears and all your greed at the same time. You know, I wasn't allowed to own stock. In traditional media, you can't own stock in companies that you report on. So I couldn't get in on the ground floor or the ground floor, at least back then of Apple in 2007, 2008. But I think today, even for a 10 year period where a lot of things have incredible potential, I think even today I would still go with Apple because the idea, I mean, just for me, of owning money for money's sake, which has never mean as much to me as like looking at an iPhone or a Mac or a VR headset one day, or even a car and saying, yeah, I own a piece of the company that made that. What can Apple do beyond increasing speeds and feeds and battery life, all of which are important to uh, distinguish the Mac uh, with new capabilities, things that it can do better and maybe uniquely compared to other PCs. Oh, that's really interesting because I think it, it goes through multiple levels. When you have things like just the silicon they're able to bring to bear because they can fund these leading edge, even bleeding edge nodes with Taiwan Semiconductor, not just making massive dies like M1 Max, but using interposers to make dual dies like M1 Ultra, just all that packaging technology, but then off core features, things like the ProRes encode decode blocks that aren't general purpose computing anymore, but are very specific computing for very specific customer needs. And then they can extend that through not just the hardware engineering where they can supply storage, for example, storage solutions that can keep up with those high, high speed dedicated uh, rendering engines, but all the way through the operating system and even into the application layer with Final Cut Pro, that's one of those end-to-end-to-end -to -end -to -end solutions that Tim Cook loves talking about when he mentions highly differentiated products that provide unique value in sort of an only Apple way that I think is gonna 
just continue to be a huge, huge competitive advantage for them. I am wondering when you first realized that Apple were a game changer in the tech industry. There are a lot of really good videos from Steve Jobs' return to Apple, the second coming. But one of my favorites is where he talks about, you've got to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. You can't start with the technology and try to figure out where you're going to try to sell it. But just the idea, you know, Steve Jobs, the man who sold the Apple II, the Mac, the iMac, the iPhone, you know, to one of the very last products he worked on was the iPad. And he considered it one of the most important products in his life because all the previous computers, even the Mac, for him were still too inaccessible, too, still too intimidating, still too unapproachable in a very human way by people from the age of five to the age of 85. And he really wanted to see that product come to market. He wanted that to be Apple's contribution, the continued democratization of computer technology. And we still see that today. I mean, sure, Apple talks about a ton of technology now in their keynotes, and there's a ton of custom silicon, but you still have like ProRes rendering engines so that somebody can push a button in Final Cut Pro, and instead of having to wait 25 minutes on a traditional chipset, they can get it in five minutes on an M1 Max or two and a half minutes on an M1 Ultra. And I think it's that focus. It's not that Apple is a software company that insists on making their own hardware or a hardware company that insists on making their own software. They are very much a product company that integrates everything from the hardware to the software, to the services, from the Mac to the iPhone to now, yeah, custom silicon. They're the kind of experiences that absolutely does change everything. When are you coming to the Sony side? Cannon ain't it, Renee, Cannon ain't it. Man, well, never say never, like Connery style, never say never. Uh, and I think Sony is doing some amazing, amazing stuff with their cameras but I just have so much, so many Canon bodies and so much Canon glass that it doesn't seem worth it to me yet to go through all the trouble of swapping all that out and changing my workflows, however much I would have to change them. The benefit doesn't seem high enough, but I've always thought, you know, never be loyal to companies, always demand the companies be loyal to you. And then if something is no longer suiting your needs, be ready to switch to something that is. And so if that ever happens, if Canon falls off enough, if they make enough annoying decisions about which features are and aren't in every camera, and Sony improves enough that it's just so compelling, I can no longer ignore it. I'd make that switch in a Klingon double heartbeat. What are your thoughts on gaming when it comes to Apple and their Mac computer? So gaming is one of those things where I think Apple can't just build it and they will come. There's no easy Kevin Costner solution here. Apple has built it. They're getting really, really interesting with what they can do with their GPU capabilities, especially when you look at the metal frameworks providing like a single target for developers across the really, really popular iPhone and iPad platforms and the Mac, which traditionally hasn't been as popular or has been too much effort or too small a market. And anyway, I think the system on a chip approach could be more interesting or at least less scary to big game studios now that they have a generation of consoles on AMD APUs. Apple really just has to paint them a picture of this unified market and then incentivize them as much as possible to include the Mac in that unified market. And who am I kidding? Just buy Valve already, because while it would be terrible for the vast majority of people, it would be great for the Mac and the upcoming VR headset. What would you be doing for a living if you weren't doing YouTube? I would probably go back to product marketing. I did that for a long time. I really enjoyed that. I always found media was about translating between what companies want to sell and what customers want to buy and finding the best alignment and best fit between those two things. And product marketing was so similar, but basically translating between what uh, developers could make, development could make, engineers could make, and what sales could sell and making sure that we weren't building anything that nobody could sell and we weren't trying to sell something that nobody could build. And I love the challenge, sort of duality of those two roles so if I couldn't do anything in media anymore, I would be right back in marketing. What has been the most challenging thing about becoming a YouTuber? So it's actually really hard for me to answer that because I became an independent YouTuber exactly when the world began shutting down. And I went from having tons of meetings every day, traveling every second week, to basically being locked in this studio for almost two years. So I don't have a real understanding yet of what that transition is like. But I think going into 2022 and 2023 without a team and a big corporation just 
handling everything like travel, for example, for me, I am really gonna find out. How has your gray hair benefited your channel? Cause I'm quickly getting gray over here and I gotta believe there's some benefit to being a gray haired creator. What do you think? I started going gray in high school to the point where people were asking me if I was dyeing my hair gray and I wasn't either then or now. But I think if there is an advantage to it is that it gives you a sort of a timeless quality almost like one of those Batman movies where the technology just spans so many years, you can't quite tell when in time or space it's actually placed. I hope it makes my work benefit at least a little bit from a similar kind of timelessness. What's something Apple's working on that's just huge if it comes true? Get it? Cause like huge if true, Never mind. So for me, it's health. Like just the idea that eventually I could go to the United States and maybe need some sort of medical treatment and just walk into a facility and not have to worry at all about borders or insurance or health plans or medical history, any of that stuff. But I just tap my watch and that authenticates and connects everything. And it's all approved and downloaded. And I don't have to fill out just endless forms or make endless phone calls or deal with any of that overhead. I can just get the treatment that I need. And I think that would just be totally, totally Cleo Abram level, huge if true can do it too. What are two, you know, maybe even more pieces of software or hardware uh, that you would recommend to other content creators that use Apple products? One app that I use all the time is Isotope RX9 and it's super expensive, but it is just so good at what it does. And that is take almost any audio and fix it. Just remove noise, remove a reverb and echoes. But I run just every piece of audio I have, everything in this video from all the different people who shot in all the different locations with all the different phones and cameras and everything. I run all of that through RX9. And a new one that I've been playing around with for about a year or so is Topaz Video AI, which can sort of take older videos, like for example, for me, old Steve Jobs keynotes, and it can process them using machine learning and accelerating them with things like Apple Neural Engines and GPU cores and give you upgraded versions of that video, like twice, 200% the resolution, even 4K if you have a pretty good like 720p source. It's not perfect all the time. Sometimes it is hilariously imperfect, but it can take a lot of old video that you might be just apprehensive to use and at least make it good enough that you can use it. What do you think about the future of journalism and uh, like media? I mean, that could be a whole entire video on its own. I think about this so much because for example, back when I was working, in traditional media, there was a firewall between editorial departments and advertising departments. So when you were creating content, you just did not have to think about who was advertising on it, who was sponsoring it. Your only job was to do the editorial. And now, for example, for an independent YouTuber, you most people have to carry both those hats and they have to balance what they're making with you know, what their sponsor and, and advertising requirements are and what those are compared to the authenticity and trust value of the content they're making. And it's endlessly more complicated. And at the same time, we're not just dealing with traditional journalism where you have, for example, multiple sources before something is allowed to go through publication and then multiple levels of editorial and legal sign off on it. Now, sometimes someone anonymous tweets and that gets reblogged a thousand times before anyone has stopped to think if it even makes any sense. And there are obvious advantages in terms of speed of distribution now and how so many people have access to direct primary sources, thanks to people just you know tweeting things out loud. But it does raise a ton of questions that, yeah, I would, if you got a couple hours to talk, we could go over it. Take me through your production process from scripting to hitting publish. How do you work? I've said before that my concept for this channel was inspired by you, it was inspired by Joanna, because you make an article in the Wall Street Journal and you create a video for the journal and for YouTube that goes along with it. And that sort of was my model when I thought of, I could write something that would live on the blog, the audio could go into a podcast, the video could go up on YouTube. And then, and that way, whether you found it easier to just scan through text or just to listen during a commute or to actually watch, you know, with all the visuals enhancing the storytelling, it was entirely up to you. It was just multimodal, it was accessible. Uh, and that sort of defined my process where I come up with either like an outline or a full script typically for reviews or maybe nothing. Like I just talk to the camera uh, for reactions or for Q and A, stuff like this. And then I take that and I bring it into Final Cut Pro. I edit it, uh, the A-roll, you know, usually very quickly. 
And then I spend various amounts of time putting together the B-roll and the effects and the titles and all of that kind of stuff. And then I output it as a video. I output the audio for the podcast and I take the original text or the transcript if there is no original text and I put that up on my blog. And that entire process, again, uh, inspired by you. I was watching the announcement of the M1 Ultra chip recently. And I was just thinking to myself, surely if Apple has just built the capability to effectively glue two of these chips together and get 100% scaled performance, then when you combine that with the fact that M1 chips are already so efficient as well, so much more efficient than their competition, like how do companies like Intel compete with that? You know, I never count Intel out. I just remember that they were going completely the wrong direction. And then they came up with their core strategy and that led to years and years of really, really good performance. I think one of the problems they have right now is that they come from big server chips that they've been trying to push down into you know, towers and laptops and even smaller form factors for years. And they've just always been too hot and too power hungry where Apple's been building up from phones and tablets. And now they have just even more breathing room, even more thermal capacity to really cut loose in. But I think if, if they started focusing on getting that process node, you know, finally shrunk down, not announcements at investor section, but actually implementing it and improving their packaging and maybe looking at off core features, just digging down and doing the work, shutting up and shipping, you know, stuff that would really stem the bleeding, start the healing, and not just lampoon ads that are the equivalent of Mickey Mouse bandages on their executive ego boo-boos. What is your favorite thing about life right now? One of the things is the lack of meetings. And I say that as somebody who for years had multiple back-to-back -back meetings to the point where I could barely get content made some days, just being able to wake up and focus 100% on the video I wanna make, the way that I wanna make it for the audience that I really, really care about, it's the best thing in the world. If you were not making content about Apple, if you were not an analyst for Apple News, but you still had to make a career creating video content, what would you focus on? Andrew, I would totally do like a Nando V movies, Captain Midnight, um, Cinema Wins style movie, TV show, commentary thing. A lot of Marvel, a lot of DC, a lot of sci-fi, Star Wars, Star Trek. I mean, if I was forced, like absolutely forced not to make videos about Apple or technology anymore, I think I could force myself to make videos about that. What would you advise someone who would like to strike out on their own and build their own brand, make their own content? Make sure you understand your finances really, really well, like your debt, if any, and the amount of money that you actually are going to need to do this, to be able to devote the time and energy necessary to do it full time for long enough uh, for it to actually become viable. And that could be one year, two years. So give yourself enough runway that you don't run out just before takeoff. And the other is like just network, like learn as much as you can from as many people as you can, create as many relationships as you can. Because not only is the YouTube community just absolutely astounding, amazing, so supportive, but they are just the source of so much knowledge and experience that you can use not only for making videos, but being able to sustain yourself as somebody who makes videos. Renee, you make like a hundred videos a week and they're pretty good videos. I'm not saying there's too many. I'm just saying that it's not sustainable, man. When are you gonna take a break? When are you gonna find time for you? Fun fact about me is I am not good at taking breaks. I do not handle boredom well. And I have a bunch of stuff inside me just roiling around that I, I need to get out. Like whether it was previously writing or now it's making videos. And also I am very much an indoor pet. I am not an outdoor pet. I don't enjoy that kind of stuff at all. So it's almost like this perfect blend of personality traits that make this sustainable for me. And I'm sure I'll do other things at some point eventually, maybe, maybe not. But I have very really found my bliss. And I owe actually a lot of that to you. You were the one who encouraged me to go indie and start making videos to begin with. So thank you, I blame you. What is the single worst, most anti-consumer thing that Apple has ever done? I survived two years only for Linus to get me canceled now, but I think Seriously, there's not one thing because I think there's not one type of consumers and different actions impact different types of consumers uh, differently. For example, nerds, I think it's the right to repair stuff. People who do want to be able to take care, take ownership and take care of their technology, not having the manuals, not having the parts. I think that does them harm where for more mainstream consumers, it's stuff like taking the power bricks out of the boxes 
and not offering any sort of, you know, if you really do need one, press here and we'll absolutely ship you one. And then I think more broadly, it's stuff like the CSAM scanning, where maybe from a very detached engineering point of view, this allows Apple to maintain zero knowledge while also not storing that kind of material on their servers. Uh, and that can fit their definition of privacy. It absolutely feels like a violation of sanctity at the user device level. And I am you know, super happy they slammed the brakes down on that, but I do worry, I do wonder where they're gonna take it next. At what point did you know that you were an Apple fan, not just a tech fan, but an Apple fan specifically, because I remember the moment that I decided that I would become a Palm fan. Look how well that worked out. Uh, but it was a special moment for me, and I'd like to know if there was a similarly special moment for you. So I was all in on Microsoft for a long time, like from DOS through the early versions of Windows. Uh, I had, I built my own PCs. I had Windows laptops. I had an HP Jornada. I had various flavors of Windows mobile devices at the Palm Trio Pro. And I really bought into Bill Gates's messaging at all of those CES conferences about how these devices would all work together, would all be part of a greater ecosystem. And they just, they never delivered on it. And it was right around the same time that Steve Jobs did the original iPhone keynote. And I had just never, never seen anything, any user interface that looked that felt, that acted that way before. And I saw that Apple was starting to deliver on that unified ecosystem up to and including like iOS 8 where they announced extensibility and also continuity where you really could start using all of these devices together, everything from handoff to SMS forwarding, call forwarding, all that sort of thing. It really delivered on that vision of computing that I always wanted and I was just, I was all in. What superpower would you wanna have and why? you on that, enough said. I've actually thought about this a lot because many of the traditional powers come with huge disadvantages that they don't tell you about. Like invisibility, you get hit by a car because they didn't see you standing there. Or flying, you break your legs every time you land. Or invincibility, you can't get your vaccine and then you die from like an, an infection or a virus or something. Uh, but what I, what I really decided on was sort of inspired by the Crow, specifically the Brandon Lee movie version of The Crow, rest in peace, uh, is that this ability to project empathy. I have something to give you. I don't want it anymore. If you could have everyone feel what everyone else is feeling, every moment of joy and sorrow, every triumph and failure, I hope it would help us like in the very Grant Morrison, all-star Superman, Lex Luthor, revelation sense of the word. It's like, like it's all just us in here together. We're all we've got. And just allow us to move forward without falling back just so always. Have you ever considered adding a sidekick? I'm not volunteering for the role of your sidekick. I mean, look, this, this face is not meant for you too. Uh, but I think you should think about it. And I'm just curious if you ever have and uh, why you think sidekicks aren't more of a thing on YouTube. You know, I think it really does depend on the person making the videos and the content type. Like you'll sometimes see Lou Unbox Therapy talk to Willie Do, uh, his producer, or some of Linus's videos, the host is bantering back and forth with the producer or the camera person, and it can create a really good effect. And then you sometimes have you know a couple of hosts like Colin and Samir doing the show together. And you know, I've done shows with Georgia Dow for years and years and years, and that works really, really well. For the main stuff, for the stuff I'm doing on this channel, I've just, I've wanted to focus on this one person, single talking head format and just get as good as I possibly could at doing it and not try to you know, do many, many things badly. But as I get better at this, as I get more stable with this, I do wanna experiment more and I do wanna expand more. If you, if you do wanna change your mind, John, and you wanna send in an application and you can do either a really good Ed McMahon laugh or a really good Nightwing backflip, just let me know. What is your best Steve Jobs moment? Oh man, that could be a whole entire video too, because I think a lot of times people forget that Steve Jobs was a whole entire person with a huge range of personality traits and either focus almost exclusively on him being like the saint of modern consumer electronics or some kind of interpersonal relationship demon uh, and forget that there's an incredible amount of nuance in between. But one of the stories I always loved most was uh, Steve would take Scott Forstall who ran iOS to lunch at Cafe Max, which was the name of the cafeteria 
inside Infinite Loop, and it's the name of all the cafeterias at Apple now, Cafe Max, for lunch. He would insist on paying. And I was like, it's, it's like, you're paying me enough that I can afford the $8 lunch. And he said, no, 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 this is great. I only get paid a dollar a year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who's paying every time I badge. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. He was a multi-billionaire <laughs> scamming Apple. <laughs> but you know, bringing a friend and a colleague along for the ride. 24 frames a second or 30. So I'm gonna get canceled by Marquez because I, I happen to prefer 24 frames per second. I think they're both valid formats. I tend to see 30 frames per second as more of a TV sort of a thing, which some people do equate YouTube to and 24 frames per second is more of a movie thing. And I realize that what I'm making is a far stretch, incredibly far stretch from like Star Wars or Unforgiven or, or anything cinematic like that. But just to my eye, the way that 24 frames per second looks sort of motion blur you get from it is just more appealing. So that's what I shoot in. And what's your favorite jujitsu submission? Mm, dying to know. Kimura, the bent arm bar, because you can slap that on from almost any position at almost any time. And you can use it you know, as a submission by itself, but it's also an incredibly good lever to control movement and set up you know, regular arm bars or spin into back control or uh, other kinds of chokes, almost anything. It just, it gives you so much versatility. It's like, it's like the Swiss army knife of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu submissions. I love it. If you could be any type of cosmic entity, which one would it be? I mean, there are there are so many options from your dark sides and Thanoses to your living tribunals and celestials and beyonders and, and all of that. But if you really get down to it, the Phoenix Force has just- No, no, that's just a joke. Oh. What are your future plans for you and your channel going forward? So Marquez, MKBHD, did this video with Jimmy, with Mr. Beast, where Jimmy was talking about how everything you want as a YouTube creator, every freaking goal you want to hit, whether it be subscribers, you want to hit a million or 10 million or whatever, will come if you just make the best videos possible. It's just, it's extremely hard. It's excruciating even, especially just the amount of ego destruction that you have to be willing to go through because like it's easy to think your videos are already great uh, or that easier ways of making them are somehow justified. You know, like, like this person just, sits in front of a mic and talks and gets a million views, or you know, like you don't understand me, I'm doing this auteur, high concept, whatever. Like it is just so damn easy to delude yourself into doing anything other than coming to grips with, my thumbnail's not good enough, my title's not good enough, my video's not good enough, this minute of the video, this second of the video is not good enough. So like every year I try to pick something to work on. In the first year, it was color grading and cameras and audio and just the basics. And like last year it was sound design and animation and some other things. And that was like, I, I regret that to some extent because what I'm gonna focus on this year and what I should have been focusing on every year is just making better videos, eating bitter, you know, just figure out how I can better serve, better delight, better empower my audience 1% more with every video. That is my one and only goal for this channel this year. You wanna know how I did it? This is how I did it, Anton. I never saved anything for the swim back. And that's why I have to uh, sincerely, sincerely thank you. Just everybody who was kind and generous enough to appear in this video and help me on this YouTube journey, but also every single one of you who are watching my videos, who are watching this channel, uh, who are giving me feedback and comments and helping me improve and helping me grow, helping me better understand what I can do to better serve you. You are everything. I would be literally nowhere without you. I cannot tell you enough how much I appreciate you, how much I thank you, and there's just so much more to come.